I'd like to welcome you to the third presentation in the evidence. As, you, as you've seen, this seminar answers some of life's deepest questions. Questions such as, does God exist? Where did life on planet Earth come from? Is there a supernatural intelligence beyond the veil of our physical world? Was Darwin right? The evidence looks at these big life questions through the lens of science. Now, last, last night, we looked at Darwin, one of Darwin's dilemma. Darwin explained how life, uh, if you go back in time, all of life could, could be explained through uh, being evolved through slight changes over millions of years from a single-celled organism. But what Darwin couldn't explain was how do you get that single-celled organism from inorganic material, like rocks, dirt, chemicals. How does that happen? And we looked at uh, how in order to get that single-celled organism, the most essential element is proteins. You need about 250 to 400 proteins just to get a single working cell. Proteins, each protein is made up of smaller blocks called amino acids. And to get a very small protein, you need about 150 amino acids. Those amino acids need to be sequenced in a very specific sequence in order to have a functioning protein. The problem is, the only way that you can get that specific sequence is through information in DNA. You can't get it by chance. There isn't enough time for a single protein to be correctly sequenced with amino acids in the entire universe. In 14 billion years, there isn't enough seconds, even if you had a different combination or even a billion combinations every second, there wouldn't be enough time in the entire universe to form a single small protein. The only way that you can form proteins, and the only way that for proteins are formed today in every cell, in every organism around the planet, is through the information in DNA contained in the very nucleus of a cell. That information in DNA could not come about by chance. The chemical components of DNA cannot explain the information in DNA. The only way that we get information is through intelligent sources. And so, by the end of last night, we came to the conclusion that the only way that life could exist on planet Earth is through an intelligent source, an intelligent designer. There's no other plausible theory, no other plausible theory other than intelligent design, sometimes called creation. Tonight, we're going to work our way up the evolutionary tree from bottom to top, and we're going to look at evidence for intelligent design from the very bottom all the way to the top of the evolutionary tree. We're going to show you tonight how each uh, each segment of that tree shows complexity that completely defies evolution. Now, Darwin pictured all of life as this evolutionary tree. All branches eventually lead back to one common ancestor for all life. All life is related and is, and is evolving from a lower form up to a higher form of life. Intelligent design is an alternate theory to evolution. Rather than viewing all life as a single tree, intelligent design views life as an orchard of trees. Let me explain. There are distinct kinds of life forms that can produce variety. For instance, you have on the bottom left hand of the screen, you have the wolf, 
and it produces other kinds of dogs. You have a fox there, you have a pug, you have a Dalmatian, you have the butterfly-eared dog, uh, you have all of these different dogs, but they all are in the same kind. And then you have the primates, and then you have the humans, different kinds, but not able to cross boundaries. In other words, all variety can be traced back to a single kind, but no further. An intelligent designer, a supernatural being like God, created different kinds of creatures and the ability to display slight changes within each kind, but there are limits. In evolution, there are no limits. In intelligent design, there's variation, but that variation has limits. Just as an apple cannot become an orange, so in intelligent design view, a monkey can't become a human. But a monkey in intelligent design can produce a different size or shape or uh, color of monkey. Now, for intelligent design to work, there are several things that you need. First of all, you need evidence of instant creation. In other words, evidence that cannot be explained by gradualness. It, it has to all be there at once or it can't be there at all. Instantaneous creation. You also need evidence for boundaries in the animal kingdom. Adaptation in a variety should have observable limits. In other words, a, a creature can change only so far but no further. This is for intelligent design to work. You also should see complexity. Irreducible complexity should be, uh, should be observed. In other words, a creature is so complex that if you were to try to explain it uh, through its individual parts, it would be impossible because all those parts need to be functioning at the same time for that creature to work. And Last, their design should be evident. As you go up the evolutionary tree, you should be able to see evidence of design at every single layer that you look, from single-celled organisms all the way up to blue whales. Organisms should display designed attributes. What are the limits of the evolutionary theory? Well, listen to the limits that Darwin himself placed on his theory. In Origin of Species, page 189, he says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous, successive, slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. So there are, there are limits that we, that we should see in the evolutionary theory. Likewise, he says, natural selection acts only by taking advantage of slight successive variation. She can never take a great and sudden leap, but must advance by short and sure, those slow steps. Natural selection is scrut scrutinizing the slightest variations, rejecting those that are bad, preserving and adding up all that are good. So, here's what you need for evolution to work. This is what you should be able to see in the animal kingdom if evolution is a valid theory. First, you should be able to see deep time. This is what uh, Charles Darwin got from reading Lyell's book on geology. Millions of years. You need lots of time because the changes that happen in evolution have to be gradual. And you need enough time for all those little changes to add up to a major shift. So the first thing you need is deep time. The next thing you need is baby steps. Uh, evolution says there's no gigantic leaps. You don't have a, uh, a caterpillar one day and then the next day you have a fox popping out of the cocoon. You just can't have that. In evolution, it's slow, gradual steps. Only slight modifications are allowed. Number three, you have to have life. In other words, the changes that are introduced into an organism cannot result in death. Why? Well, something that's dead can't pass on those changes to something else. So it has to live through the change. If it changes, but it doesn't live through the change, Boom, it stops right there. 
Number four, you have to have reproduction. Organisms must be able to reproduce. If they can't reproduce the change, boom, it stops right there. An example of this would be a horse and a donkey, right? A horse and a donkey produces a mule, but it stops right there because a mule can't reproduce. So that's what you have for evolution. So let's start right at the bottom with the single-celled organisms and one of the, the single-celled organisms that we can study and this is the perfect place to start is bacteria. Why is bacteria the perfect place to start? Well bacteria should be able to prove evolution true. Evolution depends upon slight changes or mutations in genes of organisms that over many generations allows an organism to evolve into another organism. So you have a little mutation and then a little mutation and then a little mutation and after many generations you should see major changes from the initial, uh, uh, from the initial generation. Bacteria can reproduce every 20 to 30 minutes. So you can see a lot of generations in a short amount of time. Scientists can observe mutations over thousands of generations in just a short period of time. Well, Michigan State University, an evolutionary biologist by the name of Richard Linsky and his colleagues searched for signs of evolution in bacteria for 20 years. Now, how many generations of bacteria can you track over 20 years? Well, they tracked 40,000 generations of bacteria. That's 40,000 slight changes in the bacteria. 40,000 opportunities for those mutations to continue to add up. After the 40,000th generation, you should be able to compare that generation with the initial generation and see major changes. What did they see? Well, they, what they discovered was that none of the bacteria evolved into new bacteria. The mutation simply left the bacteria dead or degenerated because mutations never add new information. Mutations simply take away information or damage the information. Alton Linton of University of Bristol, emeritus professor, said throughout 150 years of the science of bacteriology, there is no evidence that one species of bacteria has changed into another in spite of the fact that populations have been exposed to potent chemical and physical mutagens. Since there's no evidence for species changes between the simplest forms of unicellular life, it is not surprising that there is no evidence for evolution throughout the whole array of higher multicellular organisms. What we will see is that bacteria is a sample of what you see the entire way up the tree. Now, one machine in bacteria that seems to defy evolution is the bacterium flagellar motor. Howard Burge has labeled this cellular machine as the most efficient motor in the universe. It can spin at 10,000 rotations per minute. 10,000. And then it can stop on a dime. It can stop within half a turn. It can turn and start rotating at 10,000 RPMs instantaneously. This motor is composed of 40 different protein parts that all must function together or the whole thing won't work. It has a propeller, a bent joint, numerous bushings, a rotor, ring, a ring to spin this thing around. Now, how could you build this system gradually when you need all the parts at once in order for it to work? This is called irreducible complexity. It's so complex, you need all the parts to function or they're present at once. You can't have evolution or mutations having one part come in and then several generations another part come in because the parts are useless. They don't work. They don't work unless they're all there. And evolution <clears throat> depends upon um, working parts. 
It can't have useless parts. It's going to rid itself of useless parts. If a cell were to get one part, let's say the tail, without the other parts, the tail would just go limp and would give the cell no distinctive advantage over any other organism. In fact, it would probably slow it down like a ball and chain trying to swim upstream, right? And evolution would say, oh, you're not the fastest swimmer. You're out. Natural selection, said Charles Darwin, is scrutinizing the slightest variations, rejecting those that are bad, and preserving and adding up all that are good. So we can see that even within single-celled organisms, there are huge problems that an evolutionary model cannot explain. Now let's move up the chain to insects and spiders and see what we can observe there. The next thing we have is fruit flies, and fruit flies, like bacteria, provide a unique opportunity to test out the theory of evolution. And the reason is because fruit flies multiply so quickly. You know what I mean. You've left out those oranges just a little bit too long, and before you know it, you have 100,000 fruit flies in your kitchen. Yeah. You know why? They multiply just about as fast as bacteria. And because of this, these fruit flies are perfect for evolutionists to test their theories on whether or not gene mutation can create a new creature. In the 1980s, this search for the proof of the theory of evolution led researchers to painstakingly and purposefully mutate each core gene involved in fruit fly development. The authors actually won the Nobel Prize in 1995 for their work showing that mutations could affect specific body parts. They had wings growing out of the fruit fly's head. They had legs growing off of its back. They had all sorts of things. The interesting thing is that they could, uh, they could change the information. For instance, the information for growing legs is already there in the DNA of fruit flies. They could they could rearrange the information saying we want the leg to grow out of the head instead of the abdomen. They could do that. But what they couldn't do is they couldn't have the fruit fly grow, let's say, an elephant trunk because the information wasn't already present. The information had to be present in order for the fruit fly to exhibit that information. It showed how the mutations of particular genes affected specific body parts, but the mutations only resulted in dead or deformed fruit flies. This therefore showed that fruit flies could not evolve. The experiment showed that these creatures have practical limits to the amount of genetic change they can tolerate. When those limits are breached, the creatures don't evolve, they just die. Now, butterflies are an amazing creature, not only in the way they fly or how beautiful the patterns on their wings are, but in how they reproduce. Reproduction is a necessary element to evolution. Without reproduction, evolution is dead in the water. But fruit uh, the butterfly presents a unique challenge to evolution. The reproduction of, butterfly, of a butterfly begins with the laying of an egg. Now, butterflies will lay their eggs on a specific host plant. And the reason is because the caterpillar, when it hatches from the egg, only feeds on the leaves of that specific host plant. If the egg is laid on the wrong, host, on the wrong plant and not on the host plant, the caterpillar will hatch and it won't eat the leaves of that plant and it will die. And the evolution for that little guy stops right there. So, when a butterfly is trying to make sure that it's laying its eggs on the right host plant, it will fly and flutter around the host plant and visually measure the leaves of the host plant. Okay, got the right measurement. Then it will land on the leaves and it will begin drumming the leaves with its, with its uh, feet. And as it drums the leaves with its, with its feet, it will begin to taste the leaves with its antenna. And then it will smell the plant and once it's perfectly sure that this is the host plant, it will lay its egg on that host plant. 
the specific host plant is the only food that that caterpillar will eat, will eat. Now, once the egg hatches, a caterpillar comes out and immediately begins to eat. It can eat up, it, up to its own weight every day in food. It multiplies its birth weight 3,000 times in less than two weeks. That's a big baby. Imagine if you had a baby like that, huh? Now, the caterpillar's skin is specifically designed to handle this rapid growth. As it multiplies its birth weight 3,000 times in two weeks, its skin is stretchy so that it can accommodate this rapid growth, and yet its skin is also waterproof so that the caterpillar doesn't dry out while it's growing. It will shed its skin to accommodate its growth also, but not until it's grown new skin underneath its skin. All of this is pre-programmed and designed into the DNA of this caterpillar. Now, caterpillars have two types of cells in their bodies. They have larval cells, which make up the internal organs of the caterpillar, and they also have these cells called imaginal cells. Now, imaginal cells don't do anything as long as the creature is a caterpillar. The imaginal cells simply lie dormant in the caterpillar. The imaginal cells contain the entire, entire body structure of the butterfly that the caterpillar is going to become. So it has these two different cell types in it. At some point, the caterpillar knows that it is time to begin its most drastic transformation. So the caterpillar finds a spot on a twig or on, on the bottom of a leaf, and it um, spins a little anchor and then grabs onto that anchor and then begins to hang upside down in a J shape. And then the caterpillar begins to pump this liquid into underneath its skin. The pressure builds up and the liquid eventually uh, splits the skin of the caterpillar and comes out around the caterpillar and forms a chrysalis or a cocoon. Now what happens in the chrysalis? Well, the caterpillar turns into a butterfly, but the change is dramatic. You see, caterpillars are earthbound. They eat plants. They, are, they have large, chubby bodies and short, stubby feet. They have limited vision and limited smell. But the creature they transform into is the direct opposite of the caterpillar. Instead of earthbound, butterflies can fly. Instead of eating plants, they eat nectar. Instead of large bodies with short, chubby feet, they have slender bodies with long, delicate legs. Instead of limited vision, they have exceptional vision and exceptional smell. The caterpillar and the butterfly are two totally different creatures from one another. Now, once inside the chrysalis, the caterpillar begins to digest its own cells and destroy them. It has to or the butterfly won't form. Everything that was the caterpillar has to be destroyed and undone in order to make room for the new and novel structures of the butterfly. In any other animal species and in any other condition, this would be crazy. This would be suicide to turn yourself into cellular soup. But this is what happens inside the chrysalis. Everything turns into cellular soup or mush. And once it's all, the caterpillar has completely destroyed himself, the imaginal cells activate and the new novel structures of the butterfly begin to form. The wings, the antenna, the long delicate legs, the heart is reformed inside to fit inside the body, the brain. The eyes are transformed from these dull little eyes that can barely tell the difference between light and dark to these incredible compound eyes that can see ultraviolet light, that can see things that you and I can't see with our eyes. And once all of that is formed, out comes the butterfly. Now, once all of this is accomplished and the new butterfly has exited the cocoon, there's still one final problem the butterfly has to conquer before it can survive. Its straw-like tongue, when it comes out of the cocoon, is split down the middle in two halves. If you go up to Phoenix and you go to Butterfly World, you can actually see these butterflies as they exit their cocoon or chrysalis. The first thing that a butterfly does is it sits on a wing, uh, on, a, uh, on a leaf, 
with its wings crinkled up, and it starts letting blood flow into its wings, fluid flow into its wings, and then it takes this straw-like tongue, and it carefully puts its tongue together into one single straw. If the butterfly doesn't get this done the first day, it can't drink nectar, and it will starve and die. All of these pieces have to come together or the butterfly won't survive. Now, here's evolution's dilemma. Inside the cocoon, the caterpillar is destroyed so that the butterfly can be built. This destruction in the cocoon could not evolve. The caterpillar doesn't have millions of years. It has to get it right the first time or it's dead. Metamorphosis does not fit the evolutionary theory. Nothing about this transformation fits evolution. You can't have long periods of time to try and retry and retry and retry. You have to get that transition from caterpillar to butterfly right the first time because a caterpillar can't reproduce. A caterpillar can't lay eggs. Only the butterfly lays eggs and reproduces. So if you're going to have a creature that makes it through the evolutionary process, somehow it has to get from the butterfly through cellular soup and to the, or from the caterpillar through cellular soup to the butterfly stage on the first try, or you have a, uh, you have a dead in the water uh, creature for evolution. I mean, it just won't work. However, in an intelligent design model, if a butterfly was instantly created with all the genetic information it needed, it could transition smoothly from a caterp caterpillar to a butterfly. What we see is we see irreducible complexity in the cocoon stage. We see evidence of design in the whole process. It doesn't resemble, bl uh, re resemble blind or random chance. A caterpillar can undergo radical change, however, that change is confined within the boundaries of what is programmed in its cells. You will never see a mouse, a cricket, a dragonfly, or an ant come out of a cocoon. Why? Because the only thing that's going to come out of that cocoon is exactly what was pre-programmed to come out of that cocoon. It's whatever information is in the DNA is what's going to happen. And that information in the DNA was pre-programmed in the beginning and the full code was put there right there from the beginning. By the way, metamorphosis is the only example on earth of one creature transforming into a completely new creature. The very thing that evolution claims to be able to do. Unlike evolution, metamorphosis does not happen over millions of years, but in a few days. A new creature with a completely new body structure, new food source, and new capabilities is formed from another creature. Not through slow and slight modifications, but through a rapid and gigantic leap. Butterflies show us that this is only possible if the information is already present in the DNA from the very beginning. Now, one final way that butterflies defy evolution are their migration patterns. Monarch butterflies migrate over 2,500 miles to a specific mountain range in Mexico. But how do, they, how do they do it? This is an evolutionary mystery. The reason is that the generation that migrates to this specific region in Mexico is not the same generation that left Mexico. The generation that leaves Mexico migrates to the southern part of the United States, Texas and that area, and as the milkweed is beginning to grow, it continues to migrate north and lays its eggs on the milkweed. That generation then dies in, uh, in the south. The next generation, a few months later, um, they are born and they migrate further north up to the northeastern part of the United States. They also lay their eggs on milkweed, and then they die. The next generation migrates up to Canada. This is now the fourth generation, and this generation is called the super generation. This super generation lives longer than any of the other generations of monarch butterflies. This generation um, 
once it gets up into Canada, stays up there until the winter comes, and then it migrates from Canada all the way back down to that very specific valley in Mexico. And there it winters in Mexico, lives in Mexico all winter, and then as springtime comes, that generation migrates back up to Texas, lays its eggs, and dies. And here's the question. How does the fourth generation know where to go in Mexico? How do they know? Do they read signs along the way? Okay. Now, here's the thing. They've never been taught, never been shown. Both their parents and their grandparents have never been to Mexico. Never been. It's only their great-grandparents that were born or that, were in, that wintered in Mexico, and that's it. The only way that this fourth generation could know exactly where to go, and they go every year. The only way that they could know, the fourth generation could know, is if the GPS coordinates are pre-programmed there from the beginning. If, they, if, it's all, if the information is already there, there's nobody to teach them. Now, another mysterious creature for evolutionists is the bombardier beetle. It's about half an inch long. And what makes this beetle so extraordinary is its complex defense system. This beetle is able to mix two chemicals called hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide in a special chamber that is lined with asbestos, an asbestos-like chamber. These two chemicals mixed together in its rear chamber to form a new chemical called benzoquinone. Once those two chemicals uh, form together to form benzoquinone, benzoquinone now superheats to boiling point. This little beetle is able to mix these two chemicals together at will and form this superheated liquid in its rear, and it has twin tubes that are able to fire this superheated liquid in any direction that it wants to. Front, back, to the side. When you hear this, this firing, the human ear picks up a pop. However, it's firing three successive uh, firings of this benzoquinone so fast that the human ear can't pick up all three firings. Instead, it hears all three as a single pop. And the reason why it fires three in three rapid succession is because if it let it all go at once, it would be a little rocket. And there goes the beetle. But the beetle doesn't want to be a rocket because he, can't, he doesn't have wings. He can't control himself in air. And what happens if that beetle lands upside down? So instead, the beetle shoots Boom, 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 three fires, and with the rapid three fires, it's able to hold on. And at the same time, it's able to spray this defensive liquid into the face of its attacker and hopefully avert being eaten by whatever was coming at it. Now, here's the dilemma. This beetle is irreducibly complex. You need both chemicals, a firing chamber, and most importantly, an exit to have a working defense mechanism. If you evolve only one chemical, guess what? It's useless. If you evolve both chemicals but no exit, the beetle kills himself with the boiling reaction. Bye-bye, beetle. This mechanism appears fully designed instantaneously. Everything is there the first time to work, the very first time the beetle comes on the scene irreducible complexity. Another amazing insect that we see are fireflies. How many of you like fireflies? Ah, oh, they are so cool. Between May and June, you have to go to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. There's a group of fireflies there called Photonus carolinus, and these fireflies are able to all light up at the same time. So you, you're sitting in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. By the way, I'm going to be there May to June. I'm hoping to get a video of this. But you're sitting there, and all of these fireflies are, are flashing in sync with one another at the exact same time. Hundreds of fireflies all flashing at the exact same time. Get 100 people to turn their flashlight on at the same time. 
Couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Even if you were all on, on radio system, you know, and somebody was back there going, okay, now go. You'd at least have one person that would go, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is not only in the Smoky, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. There's also a place in Asia where these fireflies will all congregate together. Another species of fireflies will all congregate together up in a tree. And you won't see them up in the tree. And it will be dark. And then all of a sudden, the whole tree will come on like a Christmas tree. Just boom, instantly on. Extraordinary. How do these fireflies know when's the right time to all come on? The information has to all be there present from the beginning. Now, another dilemma for evolution is the chicken egg. Now, chicken eggs are a wonder in and of themselves. Did you know that a chicken egg has 10,000 tiny little holes in the shell? That's why when you boil an egg, you see all those bubbles coming up. It's from all the pores in the cell, the, the air inside the egg coming out the pores in the cell. And the, in the, the pores in the egg coming out, no, the air in the egg coming out the pores in the shell. <laughs> I'm going to get it right, folks. Okay. Those holes are so that the baby chicken can breathe. They also help to remove waste from the shell. If the shell doesn't empty the waste quick enough, then the chicken will die. If there isn't enough oxygen, oxygen the chicken will die. The egg has to be perfect from the very first chicken that has ever come in or out of an egg. Now, on day number five, the chick has formed blood vessels. Two of the vessels connect to the membrane on the inside of the shell, which transfers oxygen from the little holes called pores to the arteries of the newly formed chicken, or the newly forming chicken. On day 19, the chick forms a little tooth on top of its beak called a egg tooth. Now, that tooth is so that it can poke a little sack of air located at the bottom of the egg. And this is at on every, inside every egg. From the moment it pokes into that air sac, it has enough oxygen to breathe for six hours. It will poke that air sac exactly on day 21. And it must break through the shell or it will die from lack of oxygen. If the baby chick had to evolve, how could the chick evolve a tooth and the first time hit the air sac and know it only had six hours to get out? How could it know that? It needs the tiny holes in the shell. It needs the blood vessels. It needs the air sac. It needs the little egg tooth. All the first time that this chick is formed or the chick dies. And there's no Kentucky Fried Chicken. We just don't have it. Evolution stops right there. So here's the egg dilemma. If the egg evolves pores but nothing else, the chick will die of lack of oxygen be before it hatches. If its blood vessels reach the shell but no air sac is formed or it doesn't have a tooth to break the air sac, it will die. Everything needs to be in place the first time for the chick to survive. This could only happen through an intelligent design scenario. Evolution cannot explain this. Now this little guy is incredible. He's called a bush turkey. He lives in Australia, also known as the Australian incubator bird. They aren't big. The females are just three to four pounds, but they lay big eggs, half a pound each. Now, the one in charge of building the home is the male bush turkey. He spends a ton of time building this home. The nest is 50 feet wide and 20 feet deep. After he's built this home, the female comes to check it out. Cluck, 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 cluck. And as she checks it out, if she doesn't like it, she communicates that to her male, and he has to start all over from scratch. <laughs> he keeps building a home until she's satisfied. Once she's satisfied, she'll lay her eggs inside that nest. She, she will lay an egg almost the size of an ostrich egg. Now, this egg has a thick shell with pores that are shaped like ice cream cones. 
And this is important because the, the shell is so thick because the, the eggs are buried underneath this heavy nest. So the, the egg shells are very, very thick. As the bird continues to develop, as it grows, it needs more and more oxygen. And so that little bird, as it grows, will begin to rub its beak on the inside of that eggshell and rub it around and around. And as it wears off the inside of the eggshell, those pores will get bigger and it will be able to breathe and get more oxygen. It continues to scrape the inside of this uh, of its shell as it continues to grow. Now, once the female lays the eggs, the male is responsible for caring for the nest. He had to build the nest, so he has to take care of it, right? He keeps the nest at exactly 91 degrees Fahrenheit for seven months. The chick will die if the temperature varies by more than a single degree. The male also keeps the nest at 99 and a half degrees humidity. At 80% humidity, the eggs will dry out and the babies will die. So the male is constantly at work on the nest. Sometimes he throws sand up on the nest to achieve the correct temperature. Sometimes he's on top of the nest scraping sand off so that, it can, uh, so that the temperature can, can be the right temperature. He'll stick his beak into the nest and somehow ascertain whether or not he's at 91 degrees or whether he's at 91.5. So he's doing this constantly to keep these eggs at just the right temperature and at just the right humidity for how long? For seven months. Now, the male turkey is able to know how to keep it at just the perfect temperature and humidity. At the end of seven months, the mother and father turkey say, our work is done, and they abandon the nest before the babies hatch. At this point, the babies hatch deep down inside the nest, and once they hatch, they hatch on their back, and they begin to dig with their little feet. And they, they spend three days digging their way out of the nest. Once those little babies get out of the nest, mom and dad are long gone. There's nobody to teach these little babies how to hunt, how to eat, how to survive, how to be a bush turkey. It's all pre-programmed somehow in its little brain. So when that little bush turkey pops out of the nest, he knows how to hunt for grubs, how to... Uh, how the next year, if it's a male bush turkey, he knows how to build his own nest. Nobody's taught him. He's never seen this before. It's all information that's been pre-programmed into his little brain. Now, an amazing creature is a woodpecker. It has the strongest part on its body of any animal weight to body ratio. What part is that? Its beak. That's right. It has two toes uh, to climb on its feet, two toes in the front, two toes in the back to climb in any direction. It can climb upside down, sideways, up. It has its tail feathers spread out and are stiff so that it can rock its body and slam its beak into the tree. It has cartilage between its beak and its skull to cushion the blows. Otherwise, that little woodpecker would get a concussion. They've actually discovered that woodpeckers, when they hit the tree, in between every hit, it opens its eyes, recalculates, and closes its eyes before it hits the tree. The reason is that it hits the tree with such force that the eyeballs would actually detach from the, um, from the optical nerve there in the back, uh, there's just so much pressure when it hits, so it actually closes its eyelids to keep its eyes in its head as it hits. And you know how fast woodpeckers hit the tree? Brrr, brrr, right? It opens and closes its eyes in between every hit. Now, the woodpecker's tongue itself is amazing. It can stretch its tongue 10 inches past its beak. Most birds' tongue end at the end of the beak, but it can stick its tongue 10 inches out of its beak. At the end of its tongue, it has a spear, and with that spear, it can reach its tongue down into a hole, chasing an insect down into the hole, spear the insect, and bring it back out. Now, the tongue 
produces a glue-like stu- substance that's just sticky enough to stick onto the wings of an ins- insect, but not so sticky that it sticks to the roof of his mouth. So he's able to spit out his tongue, spear an insect or stick an insect with his sticky tongue, then pull that insect into his mouth, and once it, get, it gets into his mouth, he has a factory in his mouth that produces a solvent to dissolve the glue on his tongue so that he can swallow the insect and not swallow his tongue as well. Incredible. Now here's the woodpecker dilemma. If its beak isn't strong enough, it breaks. Without the cartilage behind his beak, he would receive multiple concussions. Without closing his eyes between hits, he would, bl- he would be blind after the first hit. With the wrong type of glue, the bird's tongue would stick to its mouth, and without something to dissolve the glue, when the woodpecker swallows the bug, he would swallow his tongue, choke on his tongue, and die. Doesn't it seem so clear that slow, gradual changes cannot explain the woodpecker? It all has to be there the first time, or you have a big fail for evolution and a dead woodpecker. Now, here's a woodpecker with a very unique tongue. It's called the European green woodpecker. Most woodpeckers have a tongue that starts in the front of its head, goes around the back of its head, and then out its mouth. The European green woodpecker is the only animal on the planet whose tongue starts in the front of its throat, goes to the back of its throat, goes back up around its head, down into its beak, into its mouth, up out through its nostril, back down into its beak, and out its beak. There's no other animal on the planet that has a tongue like this. So what animal did this woodpecker evolve from? You see the information in this woodpecker's genetic code is unique, is different, and proves that not all Uh, woodpeckers, or not all creatures, evolved from a common ancestor. There are unique and specific, um, specific things with this woodpecker. Now, another bird that's amazing is called the Pacific Golden Plover. This little bird lives in, a, in Alaska and migrates to Hawaii for the winter each year, something I would love to do each year. Now, In order to migrate from Alaska to Hawaii, it's a nonstop 88-hour flight. There's no islands, no little things that it can stop off on. It flies continuously for 88 hours. This little bird will normally burn one gram of body weight per hour. So, before its flight, it gains 70 grams in body weight to prepare for its flight. And then they fly together in V formation to optimize the burning of their their body weight so that they can can get there. The parents take off, once the parents gain 70 grams of body weight, they take off before their young are able to take off. So the parents take off, say, see you kids, we'll meet you in Hawaii, and All the way to Hawaii, they fly, 88 hours. Meanwhile, the young stay behind in Alaska and continue to eat because they also need to gain the 70 grams of body weight before they can make the flight. Once the young gain 70 grams of body weight, they also take off from Alaska and they fly to the exact same islands where their parents have landed without any guidance, without ever having been there before. How do the little, the, these little guys know where to go? I mean, how do they know that their parents didn't drop off in the sea somewhere along the way? How do they know that there are even islands called Hawaii? Inside their little brains, inside their genetic code, there's information pre-programmed there that tells them, this is the way you need to go. You need to go from Alaska, and there are islands called Hawaii. And you'll love them when you get there. (laughs) Evolution is not capable of coming up with a mechanism to account for things like this. Another amazing creature is geckos. For centuries, scientists wondered, how in the world did those geckos walk up walls? It wasn't until they were able to magnify a gecko's foot 
by 35,000 times that they realize that the geckos all have these tiny little spatula-shaped hairs on their feet, all over their feet, and really all over their body. Um, these tiny little spatula-shaped hairs form suction cups that actually allow the feet to suction to the ceiling or the wall or whatever they're crawling up. Now, if the geckos didn't have uh, specific feet and a specific information in order to know how to unpop all of these suction cups, they would place their foot on the ceiling and they would be permanently stuck. They have to have a specific foot that's able to pull everything together so that all of those little suction cups pop and that they, they can do this effortlessly. Have you ever seen a gecko run across the ceiling? Boom, 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 boom. How does it do that? It's able to plant its feet, suction to the ceiling, and take up its foot in split seconds. Incredible. Now, there's an, uh, now this is an example of natural selection. Not all geckos can climb walls. There are 14, 1,450 different species of geckos, and only 40% have the ability to climb walls. There is evidence that shows that gecko species have gained, lost, and regained the ability to climb walls over the generations. In other words, if a gecko is going along and doesn't need its ability to climb walls or, or isn't around areas where it needs to climb walls or can climb walls, it will lose its ability to climb walls. Once the need for climbing walls and the walls to climb come back into the environment of the gecko, it can regain the ability to climb those walls again. This is not an example of a gecko evolving into a separate species or even on its way toward a separate species. The information to form wall climbing feet is present in all geckos, just not expressed in all geckos. This is natural selection, not evolution. The earliest discovered geckos from the time of the dinosaurs had the ability to walk up walls. So this isn't an evolved trick. Geckos can lose and regain the ability to crawl up walls. The giant ground gecko has the same hair and muscles used by the, cl the wall climbing geckos. All geckos are co covered with these tiny hairs that can split on their feet and adapt to wall climbing. So if the information wasn't already there, the geckos wouldn't be able to climb the walls. It's information, not evolution, that explains geckos. Now here's something that you have in Arizona, the Chukwala lizard. You can see them at the Sonora Desert Museum. Now what's so amazing about this little lizard? Well, it lives in the hot deserts of the southwestern United States. In the hot desert, salt easily builds up in the Chekwala's system over time. There's a little factory, though, in the Chekwala's nose that will desalt its blood. It then sneezes out salt crystals. If it doesn't sneeze them out, the accumulation of salt will kill the lizard. So how did the lizard evolve its salt sneezing mechanism? How did it know that salt was going to kill it? And once it figured out that salt was going to kill it, it'd be dead, right? In which case, you can't pass on your information and say, hey, you need to develop a new desalting mechanism. If desalting was randomly evolved, why did it evolve in this lizard and not others? If it had to evolve to save the lizards from the salt, it would have evolved in a single, it would have had to evolve in a single generation. Now we come to the strangest creature on the planet, the platypus. Now platypus have long been hailed as the evolutionist missing link. A mammal that has the bill of a duck, lays eggs, has a beaver-like tail and some reptile characteristics. It was such a shocking discovery that in 1798, when a platypus pelt was sent to Great Britain announcing the news, a scientist came, the scientists came with their scissors and said, we're going to find where this guy stitched on this bill onto this beaver. 
when they couldn't find the stitches, they realized this thing's for real. However, as scientists continued to study the platypus, they discovered some startling facts. The bill that looks so much like a duck's bill isn't a duck bill at all. Instead, it's a unique sensory organ used to detect electrical impulses from the nerves in shrimp tails. What this little bill does is it does not prove evolution, but displays a unique design among the animals on the earth. Rather than proving evolution, this this discovery proves a truly unique creature that was designed with a unique ability. Scientists have tested this creature by taking a platypus and taking um, batteries and dead shrimp and placing them both at the bottom of a pool. Now, when a platypus dives into the pool, it closes it, it has flaps that close over its eyes and flaps that close over its ears so it can't hear, any, hear anything or see anything. That platypus dove down into the pool and went straight for the batteries. Now, why is this? When a little shrimp is swimming along at the bottom of a pool or stream or a lake and it flicks its tail, there's a nerve impulse that goes from the nerves to the muscles. It's a little tiny electrical impulse. That sensory organ of the platypus can pick up those nerve impulses and find the little shrimp with, with its sensory organ, just like that. This shows that this is not an evolved creature. This is a unique creature. Now, there's one key change between those platypus that are extinct and those that are alive today. The ones that are extinct that they found in the fossil record actually have teeth. The ones that we have today have lost the teeth. This doesn't show evolution. This shows that over, over the years, information has been lost. No new information has been gained. Dogs are the next on the list. Man's best friend. There are over 700 different variations of, of dogs. The variety in dogs does not prove that dogs are evolving into something else. Instead, it shows that through selective breeding, we can display traits that are hidden in the information system of a dog. No new information is, do is, is added. For instance, you can breed down, but you can't breed up. You can get a bulldog from a mastiff, but you can't get a mastiff from a bulldog. You can breed up, but you can't breed, do breed down. Now you can combine a bulldog and a mastiff, and you can get a bull mastiff, but you can never get a bulldog or a mastiff from a bull mastiff because information has been lost. Another example of this is the wrinkled Sharpe dog. This is a small dog body in a large dog skin. Yeah, that's right. That's what it is. It's a small dog body in a large dog skin. That's why you get all those wrinkles. So information uh, is simply passed between the creatures, but you don't get any new information. You won't continue to breed Sharpe dogs, and one day you all of a sudden get a giraffe. It, it just it can't happen. Darwin understood this and it puzzled him because back in England, he was involved in pigeon breeding. And although he was able to get all variations and colors of, of pigeons and sizes of pigeons, he was never able to get anything other than a pigeon. There, were, there was always a boundary in how far a pigeon could change, just as there's boundaries in how far any animal can change. The genetic code allows for variation but the genetic information has limits. And once you reach the edges of those limits, you don't change into a new creature. You simply die. Now, at the time of Darwin, there was an admirer of Darwin named Ernst Haeckel. Haeckel decided to put together some drawings to support the brand new theory of evolution. However, he altered those drawings of embryos in order for those embryos to look very similar or look alike to, to try and artificially support evolution. 
He was discovered as a fraud in 1884 by his own university and by his own colleagues. To support his case, Haeckel began to fake evidence. Charged with fraud by five professors and convicted by a university court at Geneva, he agreed that a small percentage of his embryonic drawings were forgeries. He was merely filling in and reconstructing the missing links when the evidence was thin, and he claimed unblushingly that hundreds of the best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. Today, Haeckel's embryos are still used by biology textbooks in high school and colleges to this day. Sometimes they're simply colored in, but they are the same drawings. Now, for a long time, evolutionary scientists promoted the idea of vestigial organs. Scientists claimed that 180 vestigial useless organs are left over from evolution. Now, Vestigial organs are not useless organs, they're actually very useful. The appendix is an example. Scientists used to think that the appendix, the appendix was a useless organ left over from millions of years of evolutionary change and today it has no visible use. That is, until scientists discovered that the appendix aids our body in recovering from infections, lowers inflammation, and much, much more. When your body, when your uh, gut bacteria is wiped out by penicillin or some other antibiotic, what is it that helps repopulate your gut with natural gut flora? It's your appendix, where a massive supply of gut bacteria is stored and held in case there's an infection or in case there's something that wipes out your gut flora. It's necessary. Just because we can live without something doesn't mean it's vestigial or left over from evolution. Just because we can live without it doesn't mean that it's useless. We can live without a lot of things. You can live without arms. You can live without legs. You can live without eyes. You can live without ears. You can live without a tongue. You can't live without a brain. But you can live without a lot of things. And just because you can live without it doesn't mean that it's useless. There's advantages for things that you can live without. Now, you've heard of the monkey to human myth. We came from monkeys. This is actually a myth, and it doesn't come from science, since science today says we are more closely related to apes than monkeys through a common ancestor. But the reason for this is that some will say we share 98% of our DNA with monkeys, which means there's only 2% difference between us and monkeys. Well, how much information is in that 2% that we don't share in common with monkeys? Well, scientists have discovered that that 2% contains 60 million letters of coding. That's enough. That's enough information to write 2,500-page books. How much information could you contain in 2,500-page books? That's 10,000 pages of informational difference. In the 98% we share in common with monkeys is our physical and mechanical design. We both have arms, legs, eyes, teeth, hair, tongues, fingernails, but our differences include intelligence, diet, social characteristics, fine motor skills, feet, and then the inclination towards religion, which no other animal on the earth has. By the way, humans also share 50% of their DNA with bananas, but that doesn't make us part banana. So as we've considered the evidence together, we've seen problems all the way up the evolutionary tree. But these very problems for evolution are actually solutions for intelligent design. As Francis Crick said, Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed but evolved. And as Charles Darwin says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ, bacteria, fruit flies, monkeys, butterflies, all the way up, existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would what everybody? absolutely break down. Now tonight, some of you may feel like science is being shaken out from underneath your feet and you're not quite sure what to do. 
You feel like you have no place to go if evolution is not true, but you do. If there's a better theory, we can be fearless. We can be fearless. We can choose to be fearless in taking the better theory. If the evidence points in a certain direction, we can, say, we can make a commitment in our mind, I'm going to go wherever the truth leads. We can be fearless explorers into the uncharted waters of truth. What ties you and what ties me to evolution this evening? What holds me back? Why wouldn't I go where logic, where reason, and where clear evidence points? As you ponder this question, I want to tell you that you cannot miss tomorrow night. There is one final dilemma that haunted Darwin until his death, the missing links in the geological column. You can't miss tomorrow night rocks, fossils, and global catastrophes. And until then, thank you for coming, and have a good evening.